welcome to the Behavior Speak podcast. Now, here's your host, Ben Ryman. Okay, welcome to the uh, another episode of the Behavior Speaks podcast. Uh, today, I'm very happy to have Thea Brain on with me. Hello, Thea. Hi. Thank you for having welcome. me. <laughs> oh, super excited! Super excited. Uh, we're going to be talking to Thea about all things peer mediated interventions, which is a really kind of interesting area that I had no idea about until I met Thea. And uh, uh, yeah, some really cool stuff kind of coming out of that. So maybe we'll get right into it, Thea, and you can uh, maybe just give us a little background, kind of how you got into the the field of ABA, uh, you know, a little bit of a summary of kind of your career so far and kind of how it led to, how it led you to sort of this area of, uh, of research and uh, practice. Perfect. Okay, so I am from Vancouver, BC originally, born and raised. And uh, so all my experiences here, except for a brief stint in Toronto, I originally uh, thought I wanted to be a teacher, which I've heard quite a bit um, from other clinicians in the field, but accidentally stumbled upon a student with autism early on and fell in love with ABA and and that population. So I've been in the field for about 15 years, started at, started as a behavior interventionist working on uh, home teams and... Uh, now I'm the director of a small private practice here in Vancouver. So I got my BCABA in 2017 and then my BCBA in 2018. And I did my undergraduate degree at Capilano University. They right. have an undergraduate program in applied behavior analysis, which I highly recommend. Big plug for them because amazing what they're doing over there. Um, Dr. Richard Stock and uh, Dr. Miriam Alfert and uh, yeah, great team over there amazing undergraduate program. And then I did my master's degree at the University of British Columbia and snuck right in and got Dr. Pat Miranda right before she retired. She just announced her retirement. Um, So that was really lucky for me. I had an amazing experience there. Um, And I'm currently doing my PhD back at school again at the University of British Columbia under Dr. Vicki Knight, who is also incredible. So yeah, I've been really lucky to um, be supervised by some of the giants, in my opinion, of our local BCBA behavior analytic community. Um, so yeah, my our private practice, it's called Early Autism Project, Inc. And it's we're just small. We're a baby company just starting out, but growing. Um, and we provide uh, behavior analytic services in home settings. Uh, but a large part of my practice now is providing school consultation. So that is where I got into peer-mediated intervention. And I'm gonna, we're going to call it PMIs from now on, because peer-mediated intervention makes me stumble over my words every time. <laughs> so PMIs, you'll sometimes see it in the literature as PMII, same thing. Peer mediated inter- instruction and intervention, I think is what mm, the extra I, I is. Uh, we're talking about the same thing. So in case you're doing some research, don't be confused. In my work as a consultant for private schools locally here, I get asked a lot or I've been asked a lot to support with social skills for students who have autism and other developmental disabilities. I really started being interested in social skills because I feel like it's something that we're not maybe doing as effectively as we are doing some other things. You know, I I feel really confident in my ability to put together a positive behavior support plan for a teacher in a classroom. I feel really confident in being able to, you know, modify curriculum and, and help with some skills training, those types of things. But social skills just seems a little bit more challenging. You know, we we do social stories and we do small social skills groups and EAs are trained to to prompt students to interact. And we work on play skills and all of these things. But really, at the end of the day, not seeing a huge impact on social skills in the natural environment or still seeing kids with autism be really socially isolated. So that's where my interest really took off. Um, And I came across PMI as I was doing kind of literature reviews and trying to figure out how to be more effective in my role as a consultant in the schools. And when I came across PMIs, I was, what I was first astonished by was just how there's such a strong research base behind it, yet I'd never heard of it. And you were mentioning that you had never heard of it either or didn't know much about it. Uh Um, So it's just not something that I'm seeing implemented in my work in the schools, teachers and uh, EAs and special education uh, professionals were not aware of it locally, for sure. And I wasn't aware of it. And it didn't come up in my training or it come up in either of my programs, as far as I can remember. 
Uh, but it's a really simple concept. All PMIs are are interventions where we're training typically developing peers strategies rather than focusing our intervention on the student with a disability. And so that's a really broad umbrella, but that's really what a PMI is. And then there are lots of ways that that can be implemented under that umbrella, if that makes sense. So there's a ton of research looking at PMIs in academic settings. So training, uh-huh. training typically developing peers to kind of be a coach in a science class so that there's increased engagement in the academic work for a student with a disability that's coached by um, a typically developing peer. And there's some really amazing results um, that, that, you know, it's definitely an effective intervention. And then there were quite a few studies looking at teaching elementary school age students how to uh, facilitate and prompt and reinforce social skills for students with autism. So that was really exciting. I work not only in elementary schools, but I also work in middle schools and high schools and was not seeing as much research for that age range as far as supporting social skills. So that's Uh where my thesis project was born for my master's degree. And we did a project uh, called Effectiveness of a Low-Intensity Peer-Mediated Intervention for Middle School Students with Autism Spectrum Disorder. Say that three times fast. (laughs) Yeah, so that's where my That was a big mouthful, but that's where I um, stumbled across PMIs because I was looking for something that was effective in a school setting where we're actually going to see real social skills in natural environments improve. Cool. So you say there's a a strong research base, and maybe I just wasn't looking up the right sorts of things, but I couldn't find a whole lot of PMI studies. Is it PMI itself that has a lot of research or is it sort of the the pieces around it that have a lot of research? I mean, I think it depends on what, what we mean by a lot. But, you know, there were certainly more than a dozen studies, probably more than 20 studies. I oh, think okay. one of the challenges is probably around language. And I think that that's an issue across areas of research that <laughs> um, makes it really difficult for clinicians to access research effectively because you really need to kind of know the keywords and people talk about things in different ways. So yeah, I think that that's problematic and something that researchers and putting myself in that camp, we all need to make sure that we're being user friendly, I guess, as far as the language that we're using and making sure that our research is accessible. So I think uh, that might have been part of the problem. So are PMIs sort of called other things or... Yeah, I'm not sure what I'm not. Yeah, I'm not sure what the struggle would have been as far as PMIs. I think it's generally called PMIs. Mm. Um, I can. There are a couple of literature reviews um, mm. that summarize everything that were done more recently. Like in the 2015, there was one in 2017, I believe, is another oh, one. Wow. Okay. Uh, oh, sorry, 2016. That was Chang and Locke, and then was 2016, and Watkins et al. was 2015. So if you wanted to look up kind of a a quick review of what had already been done up to that point. Those would be good articles to look up. Now, I feel like there's someone else maybe that's not in sort of the the ABA kind of um, field, but maybe locally that's also doing this kind of research. Is that true? Is there there someone, maybe someone at SFU or... I haven't, not that I came across when I did my literature review for the study that I did for my master's degree. Right. I haven't started my updated literature review for my PhD work, yeah. um, but that's interesting. There are people out there who are doing things and not calling it PMI. So a PMI yeah. just means that we're focusing on our intervention as the adults on the peers as opposed to the student with a disability, which I think, I mean, I think that's probably a really simplistic definition and someone else might have a more technical definition for you. But really, for me, that's what a PMI is. And then you can get more specific into your, you know, into your intervention that you're doing. But it's taking what what I what immediately attracted me to PMIs was this idea that we're taking um, some of the, the pressure and demand off students who are already working really, really hard. They're working, you know, the kids we work with who have developmental disabilities, are working so hard all the time. And what I love about PMIs is that we're putting a little bit of the work, in quotes, on typically developing students. 
Uh It shouldn't only be up to the student with autism to change their behavior. This is about teaching, typically developing kids, how to interact with a wide range of people. And I think that that's a really important skill. I would be Uh very happy if my children, you know, went through the school system and their takeaway was they learned how to interact with all different types of people effectively. Absolutely. I really like that that point because that I've been sort of following a lot of the uh, the autistic kind of social media groups, and uh, you know some of them are related sort of you know extra quote quote unquote ABA reform and and you know kind of that sort of stuff. And one of the pieces that comes up a lot, one of the sort of the arguments that come up a lot from the autistic perspective, at least as I understand it, and if anyone who's autistic, feel free to email me and correct me, is exactly what you say there, that that it's not about, it shouldn't be about changing the person with autism, uh, uh, number one. Uh, and uh, number two, it's it's not just about environmental changes, it's about, it's about changing the way kind of we think of these folks, right? And and how we interact with folks. I I don't know why I'm trying to paraphrase. It's exactly what you said. It's 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 teaching typical folks to change their behavior and how and and to teach them about the autistic folk and that sort of thing versus trying to kind of do it the other way. Yeah, and if you look at all the other social skills interventions, it's all about, you know, you have this deficit. We need to fix that. Instead of teaching, you know, other kids, hey, you have this peer and I think they really want to hang out with you or, you know, they're uh-huh. saying they really want to hang out with you. So let's let's make that happen. And here's what you need to do to make that successful. hundred percent. hundred percent. I mean, and I think that's what really kind of drew me to uh, to sort of the, this idea. It's so simple, but it's so revolutionary. I think. Yeah, that's how <laughs> I felt about it, too. So I was. Yeah, it sometimes. You worry about the simplicity about of things, but the response has been so positive for everyone. So, you know, we took some social validity data when we did our, our research and teachers are excited about it and peers are excited about it. And I believe it's uh, Carter and his group out of Vanderbilt. I hope I'm correct there. Yes. That's been doing some research on the impact for those peer coaches who are involved in these types of peer mediated interventions. And uh-huh. that's really important. But I think really, you know, from my perspective, it's only positive. And I think that that's what's coming out in the research as well. It's important to study it so that we have the objective data, of course. Yep. Um, <laughs> but we also have that kind of qualitative data that we're now including in, in research more and more, which is great, showing us that, indeed, we think it's common sense. Of course, this would be beneficial uh-huh. to the typically developing peer as well. And, and it is. I mean, that just makes yep. sense. Um, yeah. I mean, on a, on a whole lot of levels. I mean, it's and it's not just sort of... Uh... I mean, I think the the primary level is just, you know, relationships and making connections and understanding that autistic people are super cool and have lots to offer and lots to contribute and lots of great ideas, and lots of thoughts and um, and all that sort of thing. But I think also it's sort of there's probably a side benefit, I suppose, of, you know, maybe getting some of these younger kids interested in maybe doing this as work down the road. I mean, I, I never heard of autism until... You know, I was like 25 because, you know, the, the term was just never spoken of and and certainly not in school. We did, you know, it was uh, I'm, I'm in my mid 40s and I, I recall one person through my whole sort of school career that had, you know, a level of special needs. And they had you know, like I think it was like it was like muscular dystrophy or something like that. And it was super obvious, physical you know, visual disability, but you never, it was never spoken about sort of, you know, these other folks. And so you never have that background until, you know, it's kind of too late. And then you, and then of course it's shaped to be, you know, autistic people are people with, you know, always people with intellectual disabilities and always people that, you know, can't talk and always people that, you know, you know that don't have abilities. And, you know, I, I, I was taught a lot of things that I had to sort of relearn. And so it's a really good opportunity for, you know, young kids to just learn about autism. Yeah, for sure. And and as part of our research um, project, we didn't talk about autism specifically. We talked about individuals. And what was really cool is that during the training, we kind of had this open dialogue. And what I took away from that was that I think there's this history of we're being inclusive if we don't point it out or label it 
for mm-hmm. children that there's differences. And we're not giving children enough credit if we think mm-hmm. that they're not noticing those differences themselves sure. and they're coming up with their own answers and sure. their own ideas about it. Um, and those aren't always the conclusions we want them to come to, right? But I think the uh, the takeaway from that was how observant these participants, these kids were and how much they'd taken in. And, and they actually had a better understanding than I expected mm-hmm. of their peer who had autism. They just weren't sure where they fit in or, or how, mm. how they fit in with that. So all of the participants, all the peer coaches in our study – were volunteers. So they were recruited okay. by the teachers. They kind of in their minds recruited people they thought might be interested and spoke to them privately and just said, hey, there's this opportunity. Would you be interested? We had no problem with recruitment. You always hear yeah. that that's the hardest part in research. <laughs> it, yeah. it, it delays everything because recruitment is so challenging. We would had no problem at all. We actually had more peer coach participants than we intended to because we just you know, we felt too bad to turn. There was one um, one student with autism and we wanted two to three peer coaches, but we ended up with four because we just couldn't say no to the four. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so they were all really excited, but they all communicated to their teacher and communicated to me at the beginning that, you know, oh yeah, we, we like, you know, Joe in our class. Um, do you play with him? Well, no, not really because we, yeah, we don't, we just don't know. You, they, they, they didn't know what mm-hmm. to do. So they were interested mm-hmm. in playing. There was motivation there. But yeah, they just didn't have the skills. And our intervention was, you know, we talk about PMIs being simple. The intervention was very simple. So yeah. we had three participants with autism. And then we had, uh, and then there's participant groups. So each participant was, uh, had to, uh, two to four uh, peer coaches. And then the classroom teacher was part of it just by my nature of recruitment and doing the social validity for us at the end. All of these students attended school at the same school and it was a middle school. So all the participants were between the ages of 11 and 13 and they were all boys except for one. (laughs) So it was a group of mostly 12 year old boys uh, in this study. And I learned a lot about 12 year old boys and they, they pleasantly surprised me. They were an amazing group of young people. Yeah. I was really impressed with them. So they, the peer coaches all volunteered and the participants with autism, we specifically were looking to kind of fill a bit of a gap in the research, which was looking at not just that kind of age range where they're not, you know, older um, young adults and they're not little kids with autism. So there was that gap in the research, the middle school kind of age. There's also this gap where there's a lot of PMI research that's done with students who have autism, but no intellectual disability. So um, no communication delay no problem behavior, that, that kind of uh-huh. thing. So we were specifically recruiting for students who didn't kind of fit that Asperger. I know we don't use that anymore, sure. but the Asperger kind of profile. So there's a lot of yeah. research with that profile. Um, so we were looking for participants who had some communication delays um, or an intellectual disability or both. So we ended up with three participants who um, who met that criteria. So we're talking about students who have one-on-one support all day long, you know, might might need help with some self-help skills, have some communication, but it's pretty prompt dependent or limited. So most of them were speaking in kind of one to four word phrases. Right. Um, one of them had a communication device that he used to supplement his language. Yeah. So that, that was the profile. They were all on modified programs at school. Yeah. We, so we wanted to see if this kind of an intervention Um, would be effective for that population. And then um, when I looked at PMIs and I thought, this is amazing. This is so simple. And it's it's been shown to be effective. Why aren't we doing this? You know, I I reflected on my work in the schools. And one of the problems with research is everything's done by researchers um, in a clinical setting or in a very prescribed setting with extra resources and funding and all of these things. Um, it's very challenging to do natural environment research, as I learned, to, you know, get adequate controls in there, but also right. allow the natural environment to be the natural environment. So one of the biggest barriers, I think, to um, actually seeing evidence-based practices in schools or seeing, you know, those – the evidence-based practices we're seeing in research actually happen, and that's known as the research-to-practice gap, and lots of people have been uh-huh. talking about that – is this idea of 
resources and um, how efficient something is and how cost effective or not something is uh-huh. and uh-huh. really thinking about it from more of the administrator level of things um, as well as what is a classroom teacher going to think is too much for their plate. Yeah. So Dr. Pat Miranda and I looked at all the PMI research and what we found is that some of the literature, some of the studies were really, really short interventions and and some of them were really, really long interventions. The range was anywhere, I believe, from six minutes. There was one intervention, Mm -hmm. I think it was six, a six minute intervention Mm -hmm. to one that was two hours every week for 12 weeks or something like that. And all of them were effective. And so, and so from my perspective as a consultant working in schools, I thought, well, what are the, what is the school going to prefer? They're Mm -hmm. going to prefer the efficient intervention. And so we really focused on the low intensity. That's what the low intensity part of our uh, study was about, was just keeping the intervention time and the resources required as minimal as possible and seeing how effective that would be. So our intervention ended up being 45 to 50 minutes long. If you're planning on collecting continuing education units for this podcast, you'll need to know the three secret words. The first secret word is peer, P-E-E-R. Great. I really like that, I, uh, that, that sort of piece because, uh, you know, you touched on something that uh, I, I'm, I'm going to leave names out, but uh, there's some, been some really good research lately that I've seen, you know, particularly in kind of PBS, I don't see how one could do that in reality because you don't have those resources and you don't have, you know, you don't have the funding and you don't have the time um, and, and sort of all those pieces. I mean, it, they're, they're great studies and they have amazing results and some amazing change. I mean, they're, they're, they're you know, they're practice-based studies, but in reality, replicating those in, in real life just isn't going to happen. And so I, I love that you were looking at sort of how you can create something that we can actually continue to use after the study's done. Yes. So that was my big goal. And that's and uh, I'll jump into my PhD work in a moment. But uh, yeah, yeah. I, I agree with what you're saying. One of the things that really stood out to me, and, and since I'm still in, in you know, the learning we should all always be learning, but I'm still yes. very much in school. I'm very much a student. I am, you know, really immersed in the literature and constantly find myself thinking, well, yes, that's gold standard. However, in BC, our funding model, mm-hmm. <laughs> and I work primarily with students, uh, with children and families who are over age six. So we're, we're operating with really limited funding. And I rarely work with a family who is able to supplement beyond what the government funding allows right. for. So yeah, some of those interventions are just absolutely unattainable with our funding model. So how to, yeah, navigating that. And then there's what schools are willing to do and what they have funding for and what they allow mm-hmm. outside consultants to do or what they don't allow outside consultants to do. All of those really practical things that I wanted to make sure were taken into consideration. So jumping back to the study, so we now have three participants with autism with um, varying intellectual abilities, varying communication abilities, and we have, I think, nine peer coaches in total across the study. And we first collected baseline outside on the playground, and we just wanted to see what uh, how much engagement was happening. So were the participants with autism engaging with peers? Were they hanging out with peers? Were they playing with peers? What were they Uh doing? Were the peer coaches who hadn't been trained yet, were they using any of the strategies already? I know Dr. Ainsley Boudreau, for example, did a study using PMI with preschoolers. And that that's the name. Sorry. That was the that's the person I was trying to think of. Yes. She does call it PMI, but you might be confused because she calls it PRT PMI. Because uh, she's from Nova Scotia. Of course, yes. Nova Scotia, home of PRT, yeah. PRT, yeah. And yeah. so her study was fabulous. And they used PRT. They trained preschool children to implement PRT strategies. Wow. Okay, another interview, if you're listening. Yes. <laughs> I'll get you in touch. She's very gracious about her time. and. I'm <laughs> Cool. I'm sure she'd talk to you. She also, um, sorry, this is a tangent, but she also yes. has done 
amazing work with selective mutism and the autism oh, population. So really cool. Yeah. Okay. She's not a BCBA. That's all right. So, but that's okay too. Forgive it. <laughs> we still love you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think. I don't think. Anyways. Um, so where were we with, with my study? I did a big tangent there. So you were you were doing the baseline. Baseline, right. Okay. So how much were they engaging? How much were they communicating? So those were our two dependent variables, engagement right. and communication. And during baseline for all three participants, there was zero engagement. Zero. Okay. So it was, yeah, I when I talk about this, I it's, it's a, it was a sad thing. It's a sad thing to look at on the graph. If you look up my article and you see the graph, it's a yeah. flat line. It's a flat line. And what, and what that looked like, you know, narratively, anecdotally, was children who were completely isolated. So we had um, one participant who hung out on the swings for the duration of his break. We had another yep. participant who would hide in a bush and throw pine cones at a fence for the duration yep. of recess with an EA kind of standing nearby to make sure he didn't run away, but not interacting with him because it's his break time, right? <laughs> and uh, yeah. what was our our third friend doing? Oh, he would go to the, our third friend would go into the library and build Lego by himself. For the duration of baseline, um, and it was a multiple baseline across participants. So, so, you know, our third participant was in baseline for a while. There was zero engagement. One question about the baseline that I was just curious. Um, so you're measuring, obviously, not only the uh, the students with autism, but you're also looking at the coaches, right? And so did you sort of encourage the coaches to be in the same area? Like, how did you sort of measure the coaches' baseline? Yeah, that was a big question. So we decided because it was natural environment, we didn't – they were in the same area in the sense that they had access to the break areas – um, mm. as they would. And that was the same mm. in intervention. So we okay. didn't manipulate the setting away from what they were naturally, what they naturally had access to. It was actually really easy to take data on the peer coaches during baseline <laughs> because they didn't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> so if they didn't approach the student with autism, they're, they weren't using any of the strategies. So that, was, that was easy enough to measure. That makes sense. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so during baseline, not only did no peer coaches approach any of the participants with autism, no other student in the school approached any of the participants with autism. So, you know, when I was doing my literature review, that's certainly what kids with autism are at risk of social isolation. But to see it kind of, in, and, and I saw that as well, and, you know, when I would go in and, and do school observations and things, but to have it so clearly before you in a graph, <laughs> in data, this is how socially isolated these students were, kind of just motivated me even further, I guess, to continue doing this work. So baseline, flat, zero, no engagement, no communication. And then we started with one of the groups of peer coaches and we did our um, intervention. So now I get to talk about the intervention, which is f the fun part. We called our intervention Do Help Talk. We just wanted something catchy that um, – we could easily like quickly prompt or remind the peer coaches what, you know, the strategies were. And yeah, we landed on do help talk. So, so the do help and talk strategies were pulled from the existing literature. And as I was kind of touching on earlier, you know, called lots of different things. That was one of the reasons we came up with the do help talk actually was because we were going, oh, well, all of these, all of these studies are using slightly different strategies. But when you actually categorize them, and, and there, I think in the uh, literature reviews, there was some categorizing that happened. These all fall kind of under this strategy, or these all fall kind of under this strategy. Really what you're seeing mostly, the most common strategies are teaching prompting. So teaching the typically developing student how to prompt um, their peer. Oh, I don't know if you heard that big snore. That was my dog. <laughs> uh -huh. That was <laughs> it, awesome. It, she's dreaming. She's chasing rabbits in her sleep, so... Perfect. It's still going on. Um, <laughs> 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 that totally derailed me. So do help talk. The strategies pulled from the literature. Um, the main ones that we found were prompting. So teaching typically developing students how to prompt, whether that's um, using modeling strategies, um, verbal cues, gesture cues, those types of things. The other one was initiation. So teaching really that's just approaching a student with autism or developmental disability and saying, hey, do you want to play with me? <laughs> um, <laughs> but we had to teach that because it's not happening. Prompting and reinforcement. So really simple. Those are the main the main three ones, initiation, prompting, and, and uh, reinforcement. 
And we added a few things in there. So do was really teaching the peers the initiation piece. And we based that on mutual interests. So when I was doing the training, we talked for a few minutes about, you know, what makes a friend. Um, and if you look back on, I did a little bit of um, research on what, what what is friendship? What's the definition of friendship? How do friendships start? And all of those things. And it's really on a simplistic level, friendships are formed around mutual interests. Um, and it gets a lot more complex than that. But But friendships generally start with two or more people engaging in an activity that they both like. You know, I think about my my own children, you know, my son would would call different people his friend at preschool depending on who he'd played with that day. Each week he might have a different friend because it was who he engaged with doing something he liked that day was his friend. So that that's kind of that that's where we we wanted to start. So we we helped the peer coaches identify what they liked to to do at break times and matched and helped them to recognize which of those activities matched with the student with autism. And then we did our training around those mutual interests. So to give you an example, uh, one of our participants with autism liked anything to do with balls. He really loved balls. He was the one throwing pine cones at the fence. So he likes throwing things. (laughs) He likes playing with (laughs) balls. He likes not really able to understand the rules of, you know, like a basketball game, but really enjoyed sports to a certain extent. And, you know, 13-year-old boys, they were quite happy. They, they That's a mutual interest. We like basketball too. Uh, so that was the first step, identifying. Um, and we brainstormed a list, not just one activity, where possible for each of the participants. And for some of the peer coaches, you know, one peer coach, it might be basketball as a mutual interest. And another peer coach in that group, it might be, you know, soccer. So uh, it was individualized. And then using behavioral skills training, we coached the peers to use those mutual, they use those mutual interests. So for example, basketball, if they identified basketball, that became the context for our training, the other strategies. So we would play, we would pretend to play basketball as we role play the strategies. So do is just simply approach your peer and invite them to play by either asking them if they want to play an activity that you know is a mutual interest. That's important Mm -hmm. because we talked about the goal being that everyone's having a good time. If one of you is not having a good time, there's no real point to this interaction. So you can either invite your friend to play something that, or invite your peer, you're not friends yet necessarily, invite Mm -hmm. your peer to uh, do an activity, or you can give your peer a choice between two activities that you know he probably would like to do. So do you Mm -hmm. want to play basketball or soccer? And we talked about things like um, for the participants in this study, approach your peer with a basketball and a soccer ball in hand Mm. while you're giving the choices. So little, we gave some nuances to the individual learner uh, that we knew would increase the success, things like that. Um, So that's the do strategy. It's really simple. All you do is you approach the peer, make sure you have their attention, and then invite them by asking them to join you or giving them a choice between two activities that, that are on both of your lists. I imagine that alone would have been huge for some of these kids, just to all of a sudden have a typical peer come up and say, want to hang out? Yes. Uh, Like like this would be, for many of them, probably the first time this has ever happened in their lives. Yeah. It was really interesting to watch because one participant in particular, he... um, he was so excited when this happened. One of those, one of those kids who really shows his joy throughout his whole body. So you, mm. you just know how excited he is. But he was also very nervous, mm. very very nervous. And so, what we saw in the beginning, if you look at his graph, participant two, I believe yep. I I should pull out the graph. But his engagement was a little bit lower in the beginning during intervention, and then it grew. Okay. And that was because he kept running away. Because he'd get really overexcited and overstimulated, <laughs> and he'd leave the group, but he'd come back. He'd come back, and then you and then you see over time more steady engagement as it uh-huh. as as he became more comfortable. Yeah, I see that his also his follow up uh, data seemed to kind of slack off a bit too. Yeah, and some of that. So talking about the results of our study. So we did we did this training. We do do and uh-huh. we do help. Let's go back a little bit, actually. Yeah, let's go talk about help and and. Uh... So help is really just teaching prompting strategies and really simplistically. So we talked about it in the context of those activities again. So let's say you invite your friend to play 
I keep saying friend, invite sure. your peer to play and they choose an activity, but then they don't start playing with you uh-huh. or they don't start playing in a way that makes sense to you. Um, what do you do then? Um, and so the prompting strategies were taught in that kind of context. And we taught, we basically taught sort of mini BST, but I guess just really modeling. So we said, we taught these peers to say, hey, when we play basketball, first we dribble the ball and then we pass it to a friend. Here, let me show you. Now you try. Um, so we practiced that so where it was a bit of instruction, a model, and then a rehearsal. And then, so that's the help strategy. And then the talk strategy had a couple of different things going on. The one thing it had going on was reinforcement. So you tell your friend how to do it, you show them how to do it, you give them a chance to try, and then give them some feedback. Give, you know, tell them that you think that they're doing a great job. Tell them that you think hanging out uh. with them is super fun. Be enthusiastic and excited and, and show them that that you're happy. So we we taught reinforcement in the sense of your peer might not understand that you want to hang out with them or you like what they're doing unless you tell them. So tell them. Uh, the other part of the talk strategy was just some strategies that we use as clinicians, but peers don't. So things like talk about what you're doing while you're playing, if that makes sense. Like I'm going to go, I mean, I'm in, I I cannot talk like someone who plays sports. I, I, <laughs> I try every time. I, I, I get what you're saying. I'm going to, I'm going to uh, run with the ball up the field and kick it in the net. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then the other piece is asking questions. So try to engage, try to get more co- communication happening with your peer by telling them about what you're doing and by asking them questions. And depending on the student, we might say, you know, yes, yes and no questions are not really effective for this learner or for your peer. So try giving them choices instead or ask them a closed-ended question instead of instead of a yes-no question. So, um, yeah, those are the basic strategies. And we use behavioral skills training to teach each of them. So we would say, okay, this is the do strategy. Here's your – and we'd give some instructions. I would show them what it looked like. And then we would practice it using the mutual interest as our context for practicing. And we did that over two lunch breaks, but they were only 20 to 30 minutes for each training. And then I said, okay, you now have these strategies. You can use them to engage with your peer. Remember that the goal is that we all have fun. So you don't have to play or hang out with your peer every day. You just have these strategies now. So if you want to, and if Uh your peer wants to, go for it. So there was no expectation. It wasn't like a schedule, you know, it wasn't a, you know, lunch buddies program. It wasn't a, on Tuesdays you meet Uh in in the resource room for a board game. I love that. I love that it wasn't forced because I think that would have, you know, we'll probably eventually talk about follow-up and sort of talk about how things you know, kind of continued after. I imagine none of it would have continued after if it was kind of forced that way. Yeah, I think so. And yeah, so what was interesting though, <laughs> and that I'd like to investigate a little bit more in my in my future research is that two of the groups came up with a schedule anyways. <laughs> oh, really? On their own. They really didn't, they didn't want, you know, we talked about social isolation and we talked about being lonely they felt really strongly that they didn't want their peer to feel lonely or isolated. And not all the peer coaches were actually friends with each other. Uh, okay. So in the example of the four peer coaches, there was kind of two friends and two friends. Wow. And so they amongst themselves made a schedule. You guys hang out with him on these days and we'll hang out with him on these days. So that was wow. in- that was interesting. And I don't know how well they stuck to it because yeah. they started talking to me about it and I said, that's completely up to you. If you want a schedule, yeah. go for it. But I'm not telling you you need to have a schedule. Right. Um, so I don't know how much they stuck to that or not. That was interesting. <laughs> so then getting into results, um, when I do presentations and I have the graph in front of me and I'm showing everyone, I always say that participant one's graph looks like I faked the data a little bit um, because we have 0% engagement and then we have 100% engagement immediately at the point of intervention. But that's just the way it was. And the simple strategy of do and giving uh-huh. kids, it was almost like giving kids permission to do what they already were motivated to do. 
but they just weren't sure if they should. They talked a lot about EAs being there. Like, well, I don't know if they're doing something with the adult. I I don't know if I should interrupt. They're that, you know, opening the door and saying, yeah, play with him, hang out with him. He wants to. and, And if you want to, go for it. I think that strategy alone was really effective. But I think the other strategy is really important for moving forward and keeping that engagement Uh going. The second secret word is coach. Did the uh, did the EAs kind of back off? Yes. What was really cool anecdotally. So they backed off naturally because we said, please don't do anything. (laughs) Mm. (laughs) Don't do anything. Just I mean, do your normal thing. Yeah. But please don't try to intervene at all in right. socially what's happening. We didn't really give any more information than that. They weren't mm. – you guys were not participants in the study. Right. But anecdotally what ended up happening during the intervention and then into follow-up was EA support reduced for all three participants. Mm. Like they actually changed the schedule because they didn't wow. need it anymore. Wow. Um. So that's the really exciting piece that I will be emphasizing for administrators as we – Start looking to roll this out a little bit more. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. That less staff were needed mm-hmm. because – and it, and it wasn't that people get concerned that peers are becoming kind of, you know, babysitters or mm-hmm. – and, it, and it's not – it wasn't that in this study. It was that when you have a student who's now engaged and isn't bored <laughs> mm-hmm. at recess, there is reduced problem behavior. Right. So, uh, you know, that's anecdotal only, but that was exciting for me to hear um, from the teachers and the special education coordinator that the schedules had actually changed for the EAs. That's so cool. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we found results across all three participants, a little bit of variability, but really overall we have zero engagement in baseline and we have some really nice effect shown after intervention. And again, that was just... Uh, 40 to 50 minutes of training those peers. There was a little bit of ongoing support that happened in the form of feedback. So I would, it was a multiple baseline across participants probe design. I, sorry, multiple probe design. So I would pop in basically and um, provide feedback when I was there, but it was very, very minimal feedback. So it would look something like, because I would stand back, we would take data, and then when the bell rang is when we would give feedback. And it would usually be we'd <laughs> in the rush of – you can imagine um, middle school bell rings the rush, right, of teenagers and <laughs> preteens. And we would kind of run along with the peer coaches and say, hey, I saw you use the do strategy today. That was awesome. Mm. Maybe next time you could do more of the talk strategy. Have a great day. Bye. So that was going on during intervention was that ongoing feedback. And then we have follow-up, which the only difference in follow-up was that there was no one giving feedback at that point. And we had not coached EAs to give feedback, um, and we stopped giving feedback. So Mm -hmm. that was the difference there. That's pretty cool. And, 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 And this would probably be anecdotal as well. But I would suspect from the perspective of the autistic kid, not seeing some adult come tell the other kid how to hang out with them. You know, you know what I mean? It like, felt um, like there was a lot of respect and dignity in this intervention yeah. that is sometimes lacking. Just simply, especially in this age group, getting the adults out of there, that mm-hmm. alone felt really important. Mm-hmm. Um, because how natural are kids, how naturally are kids going to behave? How can they model typical social skills Yeah, if they feel like there's someone hovering over them, an adult hovering over them? Absolutely. Um, so we really tried to feed back and just be as unobtrusive as possible. And um, we didn't interact at all with them. The other really cool thing I like to think about in this study is I never spoke to the students with autism, not not once, right? It's really cool to be reminded of that, looking at the graph and the results. There was no extra work that happened there for the student with autism. And in the future, I mean, we haven't talked about communication. We saw some, we saw some increases in communication it wasn't as amazing as the engagement piece, um, but that's really to be expected. I mean, you're not – no one communicates – well, maybe me because I am I talk a lot. But <laughs> most people don't communicate for 100% of 10-second intervals, <laughs> uh-huh. right? 
So uh, the fact that we we did see increases for all three participants, even if it wasn't to the same levels as engagement, I think was really exciting, especially since all three had significant communication delays. How did you measure like engagement and communication? Yeah, so that was tricky. <laughs> um, coming up with that operational definition. Um, so engagement, it was a pretty strict uh, definition that we wanted to see the participant with autism and at least one other peer actively participating in a shared activity or because this is middle school, so you're not always doing something. Sometimes, some, something, some, sorry, you're not always doing something. Sometimes yeah. you're hanging out. Yeah. So we also counted engagement if you're parallel. Yeah. So for example, you're on the swings. Engagement it would not count as engagement if you're on the swing and next to you is another person on the swing and you're both swinging, but you're not engaged in communication. That's just, right. par that's parallel play, right? Engagement would have, but it could be engagement if while you're swinging, you're looking at each other, you're talking, you're asking questions, you're answering questions. Right. So that becomes communication and engagement. So it's either a shared activity or it's parallel engagement while engaging in communication. Mm. Does that make sense? <laughs> sometimes you collect the same data. So sometimes sometimes a probe where you measured communication was also engagement. Yeah. So engagement didn't necessarily mean communication, but generally based on our operational definition, if there was communication happening, um, it was probably engagement. It was probably engagement, unless it was a yeah. passing, you know, if someone walks by you and says hi and then continues yeah. walking, that's not engagement. But if there was ongoing communication happening and some sort of activity was part of that, even if it was parallel, uh, that would be engagement. And it, it would have to be the both of them, right? So, I mean, obviously they're together, you can't have it by yourself, but communication would be, you know, the peer coach saying, hey, Bob, but also the peer saying, hey, coach. So we tracked both initiations and responses. Didn't actually see much of an increase, or if any, um, in initiations. So that's for the the student with autism, and and that kind of makes sense because we didn't do any direct intervention with them, right? No. We we didn't tell them to start initiating with peers. We no. Didn't, we didn't prompt them and we didn't reinforce them. So it would have been really cool. That would have been amazing <laughs> if we saw in, more increase in initiation. Uh, but we didn't. But we saw a lot more responding um, to peers. So the other thing about the communication definition, or we didn't talk about the communication definition, um, it was also nonverbal communication that we were tracking. So it was a, resp a communicative response can be nonverbal, and that's typical too, right? So you don't always yep. say yes. Sometimes you smile and nod at somebody. So it's any communicative response immediately following a peer initiation. And we define that as responding to an instruction. So for example, if a peer said, hey, pass the ball, a communicative response is for the peer, to act, the, the participant with autism to pass the ball. Oh, okay, yeah, that makes sense, yeah. So then we get to follow up. Our follow up was sadly quite short. And the only reason for that is because the, the school year ended. <laughs> so... Uh, I actually was at the school, uh, the last day of school. <laughs> I can't remember yeah. who, who had their last baseline data point on the last day of school, but one of them did, um, just to get, squeeze out that last little bit of follow-up that we could get. So, you know, we didn't, we didn't have as much follow-up as we would have liked. Anecdotally, I still mm. consult at that school. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. They're all in high school now. Um, one of them has moved on to another school. But the other two, um, we've continued to uh, work with the peer coaches. So what we did find is moving, we found that the peer coaches, that really maintained for one of the participants over time. For a second participant, it didn't maintain. Um, we haven't talked about that. So one of the participants only liked to play on the swing. He had a really, he had really rigid, restricted interests. He only wanted to play on the swing. And so in the beginning, that was fine. That went really well with the peer coaches. But because of this restricted interest, the peer coaches over time, after, this is after the study, mm -hmm. lost, lost some interest in continuing to engage on the swing. Yeah, yeah. Which makes sense because these are 12-year-old boys. 
You know, yeah. they actually were really happy to play on the swings at a certain point, but they lost interest over time. One of my takeaways clinically from from this experience was just how important it is that we program for leisure skills mm-hmm. <laughs> and make sure that we're teaching a variety of activities um, to our learners because that really impacted the success of the intervention over time for sure. I also uh, saw that you had a, a third measure i think you were measuring was it mutual enjoy yeah what was that about i mean that sounds like a really important yeah and a a tricky one to measure we kind of came up with that one um how do you measure how do you make sure that everyone's having a good time and because otherwise what's what is the point from a behavioral perspective we identified you know relatively objective measures of enjoyment and we included eye contact smiling and laughing And then we had a really strict definition. So in order for mutual enjoyment to be scored for a session, we had to see both the participant and at least one peer coach engaging in the same measure of mutual enjoyment. It was probably overly strict. So they both had to be smiling or they both had to be laughing. Right. Within that, within that session. Yeah. And I I would think that, uh, you know, I'm speculating here, but I would think that if you're if you had sort of high really good data for engagement and communicative acts but mutual enjoyment was kind of low then i would think you wouldn't have a whole lot you wouldn't have much sustainability and you wouldn't really have any good follow up data right cuz i mean i i'll do this i'll do this for you know the sake of doing it in school but i really don't like hanging out with these kids so once once this is over i'm done yep um, one of the so one of the participants he had, he only liked the swings so that didn't really yeah. sustain and then he actually left the school so I'm not I'm not sure another one um, he started initiating with peers so as it dropped off he started seeking he started looking for peers which was really really interesting and cool to see especially since uh, I don't know if you've heard this in your work but I often hear that um, well we we I think we sort of alluded to it earlier when we were chatting but that. Recess and lunch breaks should be a, a break time for students with autism or developmental disabilities, that we shouldn't be placing demands on students during their break times and that social social interactions are demands for these students. And so we, you know, we should back yeah, off. I've, def- I've definitely heard, heard that theory a lot. Yeah. yeah. What was really neat about this study is that, and especially since I have <laughs> continued to consult with this school and I've seen this just switch in thinking about this issue was that yes it's yes it's a demand what this study showed us was yes it's a demand yes it's hard and but it's still something that these kids wanted they uh-huh. were motivated they wanted to engage with their classmates and so once their peers started initiating with them they uh-huh. they met them there and so we lost this idea of oh we can't put that demand on them because we weren't really uh-huh. putting the demand uh-huh. on them. We were putting it on someone else. So that was a really cool switch that happened. Yeah, it was really cool. Because no, what, what I'm used to seeing sort of a, at recess is more the EA prompted engagement. Go say hi to Billy, you know. Like, Why don't you go push him on the swing? Okay. And they, they do three pushes. And as soon as the EA turns away, all of a sudden the swing is swinging by itself. And, and Billy is gone. Yeah. Yeah. So when they... When they did transition to high school, and I also am lucky enough to consult at their high school, so I still work with these students, we lost all of our gains. Um, And that was because, primarily because of, well, COVID did not help. (laughs) But it's also because there's no playing anymore at high school. And the zones were not set up. So most of the peers, most peers are either sitting on the floor in the hallway on their phone, in the cafeteria on their phone, or they leave campus and they go to a um, So that became really complicated. But I had two, for sure two, uh, peer coaches approach me and say, hey, we're in high school now. Like, what do like, we need to get this peer coaching thing going again. Oh, that's so awesome. So it's going. It's going again. And um, what we're shifting now is um, (laughs) teaching our teaching these students how to play games on phones and uh, doing community outings to NW. Wow, that's so cool. 
And maybe, maybe even learning how to, you know, skip class, right? <laughs> if, but seriously, though, I mean, if, if it's a if it's if it's a peer mediated sort of interaction and the EA is not involved, no, yeah. let's let's go bail on English and go to NW, you know? Um, yeah, we actually have a goal for one student on his IEP this year that he will respond to a text from a peer and meet that peer at the the, the little canteen. So. We've uh, we've been coaching the peers to text this student, you know, and uh, ask him if he wants to go get, you know, a preferred snack from the canteen. And uh, he's learning to respond to that by himself and, and go meet that peer. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. That's 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 so awesome. I love I love those kinds of skills. That's so cool. Huh. Right on. So now what is the big yeah. question? Right. Um, because I despite trying. I've only managed to do a PMI in one public school <laughs> right. since this study. Oh, really? Like just just as as a regular practice, you mean? Yeah. So as my as a clinician, mm. um, since doing this work, I became very excited about it, very passionate. So anytime sure. I'm sitting in an IEP meeting for a client and they say, "Well, social skills is on the IEP," and we want to see, you know, some of those IEP goals are like. Johnny will have three friends by June 2021. <laughs> um, great. I always offer um, coming in and doing some peer coach training. I mm -hmm. have had success at one school so far. It challenges with an outside clinician coming in and different districts mm -hmm. have very um, strict rules about that. And so, uh, and it, it's also not sustainable. It's also not super far reaching. It's one, one student at a time kind of um, effect, right? Mm -hmm. I like to think a little bit bigger than that as far as dissemination goes. So I, uh, my PhD research, um, we're going to look at the most effective way to teach staff who are already in the building how mm -hmm. to be the um, peer coach trainers. So it's a, uh, we call it a train the trainer model. Yes. So they, I will train them, the teachers yes. and the, or the EAs to be the peer coach trainers. And we're looking at, the study will look at what is the le most efficient, most cost effective, um, while still maintaining the effectiveness of the intervention modality of that training. So uh, for example, can I just thrust a manual at a special education, you know, at a resource teacher and say, this is a PMI and this is what you do. And here's the lesson plan. Go. Oh, maybe, maybe that, maybe that would be effective. I'm not sure. sure. May, do they need, would a professional development workshop for three hours be effective? Uh -huh. Or do we need, you know, um, more intensive training with, with video models? Um, like an online, we're looking at only um, remote training just because of the the nature uh -huh. of the cur our current world. So yeah, just looking at which modality and we're still kind of working on which which modalities we're going to offer. Which modality is most effective or are they all effective and in which case we're going which is the most cost effective and efficient. Um so that we can then hopefully finish up the research, take what we've learned and uh, create a manual and and some training resources and get this going. Yeah, and build some capacity. Yeah. Hundred percent. I mean, that, that that sort of, I mean, that's such a, just a genius way to sort of solve the uh, the barrier of the outside clinician. Just uh, I'll, I'll train you to do it, and then you don't you don't need the outside person anymore. Yeah. And so, is it? Are you looking to do it in just sort of the one school? Or are you going to do it across some schools? The third secret word is inclusion. We're looking a little bit larger scale at this point. So still at the beginning, beginning pieces of uh, proposal writing and, and all of yeah. that, that fun stuff. But um, definitely hoping to, um, you know, do an RCT at the end of it. Just uh, compare which is the most effective and then the most cost effective. Right, right, right. Because I was thinking maybe you were thinking you would do. And, if, and, if, and it's been so long since I've taken a research design course, so forgive me for not knowing my terms anymore, but that maybe it would be sort of a, a design where you would start with just giving the manual and take a measure and then add each one. 
what we might end up doing, and it, you know, don't hold me to it. I'll let I'll let you know what ends up happening. Yeah, yeah. But we might end up doing a series of pilot studies, as they're often called, or yes, um, yeah, yes, where we just look at here's a mat. You know, we maybe do a very similar design to what yep. um, my master's project was. Um, yep. But this time, the intervention is giving the EA That's just the manual. Yeah, yeah, and just seeing yep. is that effective, um, right. and if it is. Um, trying a different modality is that effective, and then right. and then later doing the larger RCT and comparing, right. yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, comparing just so that we can you know provide the options and maybe we develop training materials for both if they're both effective and school administrators can choose which route they'd like to go and they have the data to make that decision. Wow, that's so fantastic! This is going to be such a cool study, um, and so that's and and you're doing that one with uh, with Dr. Knight, is that yes, right? Yes, Dr. Yeah, Knight. Yeah. Yeah. And it, does, does she do any work in that area or is that something you're, you've kind of brought to her? So she has started to. So we part, prior to my starting my PhD project, we partnered. She invited me to participate with her on a project she was doing because she is the coding and robotics guru of yes. um, the autism world. So I've she's really this. passionate about teaching STEM or um, having STEM be more accessible to individuals with autism. Her, uh -huh. her background is in... Um, you know, special education, um, but she has a BCBA. So we partnered on a project. Uh, it was a summer camp, an inclusive summer camp for children with autism and typically developing children. And um, they were learning some coding and robotics. And what we did is we measured, um, we used the same dependent variables for communication and engagement that uh -huh. we developed for my project, just to see if simply engaging in this mutually enjoyable activity of robots, would we see an increase in engagement and um, communication simply from having access to something that we both like to do because they'd signed up for this camp. Theoretically, we all like robots. That's why we're here, right? We didn't see as much increase in engagement and communication as we would have hoped to see just simply from that. So yeah, I was, uh, yeah, this is starting to be her area, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Just like it's starting to be mine. And I think it aligns really well because her whole background and um, and passion is about inclusion and accessing curriculum. So a PMI is helping helping students to be actually meaningfully included because yeah, they're yeah. part of the social fabric of the classroom. So yeah, I think it fits really well, even though they seem like they're coming from different, <laughs> completely different no, arenas. Not at all. Like I could totally see like a a a you know a coding camp or whatever with the pure media pure media piece embedded in it, you know. Um, and so because now everyone's working on the now now the interests are already the same because everyone's working on the same topic, but now let's embed that pure media piece and have them all kind of really supporting each other. This yeah, was really our takeaway from it, that if we designed the camp from the beginning with that in mind, how neat that would be. We we tried to throw in a little bit of a PMI <laughs> halfway through the camp just to see yeah. how it would go. And uh, I don't want to dive too much into that research without Dr. Knight here. Um, no. But uh, it wasn't as effective as we would have hoped. And one of the reasons we think that was is because we didn't have – people signing it, it wasn't the intention of the camp to begin with and so we didn't have kids signing up who were like oh, i love robots and this is a this is a camp where we all you know if it was transparent from the beginning this is an inclusive camp with students of all you know backgrounds and and abilities and needs uh -huh. and you're going to learn coding and robotics and you're also going to learn how to interact with lots of different people or something like that right where if it's it's upfront and that's what we're working on from the beginning. And, and we're implementing a strat uh, the do help talk, for example, mm -hmm. um, from the beginning. I think that would have been more effective than kind of throwing it in um, halfway through. Yeah, for sure. So will the will the the doctoral research, will that also be the do help talk again? Or will that be will be doing something different or I think do help talk has a has a catchy Absolutely. feel to it. Yeah. <laughs> um, no jargon there, so right. No, nope, that's right. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it was a jar jargon free training and, um, yeah, our social validity measures were really high. So that the peer, was my next question. Yeah, yeah. The peer coaches, as far as our actual, you know, our Likert scales and we had really, really high ratings, um, for mm. the peer coaches and for the teacher. 
So they all agreed that it – one of the most important takeaways for me was that the teachers said that it was not disruptive, that they would mm-hmm. do it again, that they would love to see more of it. Um, mm-hmm. So that's really important and that's the data you kind of stress when you later talk to administrators <laughs> because, uh, yeah, they're wary of anything that adds to the load that are that teachers already have. But we did have some interesting anecdotal comments from peer coaches that were really important. Um, so I'd kind of added um, – you know, a a notes or a comment section at the end of the questionnaire. And I wasn't necessarily expecting everyone to contribute there, but I just wanted to make sure they had opportunity. But all of the peer coaches added something to the notes. (laughs) They were all very diligent participants. And, you know, the vast majority of them said really lovely, actually amazingly lovely comments about their experience. There was one participant who said that, By the end of, or at that point, he didn't say by the end, but at the point where he was doing that questionnaire, that he was starting to feel like a servant, (laughs) was his word. Um, And so this was one of the participants. This is one of the coaches. Sorry, this is one of the coaches who was paired with the student who only wanted to play on the swings. Ah, yeah. And so, you know. I force myself to highlight this issue every time I talk about it because I don't want, you know, I get really excited and overall it was amazing and the peer coaches were excited and the teachers were excited and the parents were excited and we're all excited. But I think it's really important to highlight when, you know, when something goes wrong or when things are not perfect because that's where the most learning happens. So he wasn't really happy and I didn't know that. And one of the other comments he made was that he, he felt like, It was this idea of reciprocity that he was trying to get at, that he was Mm. putting in, but he wasn't getting back, Mm. um, that he didn't know, he didn't even know if the peer liked him or not. So that was important because my takeaway from that was that there needed to be a little bit more for that participant. He was uh, the most significantly impacted as far as his intellectual disability. So he was um, the participant who was um, below the first percentile on the lighter. He definitely did not have typical ways of showing that he was happy or that he was unhappy or um, or engaging in any kind of conversation. So he was, yeah, he the peers had the most difficult time kind of understanding or knowing. So I think there needed to be more feedback provided. There needed to be more positive reinforcement for the peer coaches on the side of the adults for that particular learner because they weren't accessing reinforcement as much as they needed to for the relationship to maintain. So I think just looking at, uh, you know, when I, I guess, moving forward, training the teachers or the EAs to implement this, being able to highlight what to look for and make sh- to ensure that those peer coaches are accessing the amount of reinforcement that they need to, you know, increase their own behavior, which is, you know, the do help talk strategies. So sometimes, ideally, in the long run, that comes from, their interaction. The, the interaction becomes the reinforcer, right? Uh-huh. But I think that's naive to think it's going to be like that from the beginning or that it, yeah. that's always going to be the case. So yeah. that was my takeaway from that is that um, we knew as the adults in that situation that, that that participant with autism loved having his peers hang out with uh-huh. him. We could tell. We knew that. But it wasn't until the end when we did the <laughs> did the uh, yeah. did the questionnaire that I found out that one of the peer coaches didn't know. Yeah, so that was important. And that's cool because it also speaks to it wasn't just that like the peer coach was bored and didn't want to do this. The peer coach just wanted to know things were working out. They wanted to have a successful connection, which was really you know speaks to that peer coach and 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 that sort of piece. Did did you do any kind of uh, like? You know, this is autism no. sort of conversation. So they didn't really know much about that piece. Because this was a private school, they had – most of the peer coaches had known the peer with autism since they were right. in kindergarten or grade one. or So there had been some of that teaching at that school, um, generally right. speaking. So I did not use the word autism or disability or anything like that. We talked about – this is who your peer is. Uh-huh. Um, this is how he likes to communicate. These are some of the things he likes to do. This is how uh-huh. he shows. Um, we did talk a little bit about this is how he shows he's happy. This is how he shows he's upset. 
but it was really, really minimal. So it, it would certainly be, and I think that that's something that is sometimes included in the PMIs and definitely wouldn't hurt. But again, we were trying to be really efficient. So we focus no, more course. on the it's a, strategies. <laughs> it's a study too. Yeah. No, I, I mean, it just, you know, my brain is just sort of kind of on fire right now with, you know, all the, and I'm sure, I'm sure yours is too, with all, all the different things you can, all the different directions you can kind of go with this. Like I, like, like I wonder about things like, um, well, how, how do we convince other folks to become coaches that maybe aren't so keen? So, you know, your listeners can't, are not necessarily looking at the graph, but I encourage you, please read my article and look at the graph because what was really neat um, about this study, one of many neat things, <laughs> what was one of the really neat things was that we, we tracked untrained peers as well. Um, ah. So if you look at the graph, you can see that the peer coaches, we wanted to make sure all the peer coaches were engaged or not make sure they were. We wanted to know if they were engaged. Uh -huh. um, so if we train four, does only one engage or do uh -huh. all four engage? And what we found is uh -huh. all the peer coaches um, at one point or another during probes were engaging with the peer. So that was great. But yeah. even more exciting was we found that there were untrained peers that were starting to join in too. Wow. Um, in particular for the student who liked to play um, sports, you know, not sure. formal basketball, but – but it was still relatively age appropriate. So, and they got really creative with with the ball sports they were doing. At one point, they were running up to the top of some these outdoor set of stairs and and um, rolling a ball down the banister. And the student with autism would catch it because he had amazing catching skills. So nice. it really it was nice because it took on a life of its own. And but uh, because it was fun, and uh, these peer coaches were, you know modeling not just for the student with autism but for their other peers how fun it was to hang out with this guy because he's a fun yeah, guy yeah, yeah yeah um we started seeing that happening more and more so i think at one point there's maybe four untrained peers during one wow. session with, so cool uh, yeah so um and that was one of the pieces of feedback that i got from the peer coaches is they'd like to see more more kids trained one of the things we have not been able to do yet because of the pandemic situation is my plan for in the high school is to have the trained peer coaches who have continued to to be supportive help me in the training of new peer coaches. So I'd like to have it be kind of a mentor. You know, they're the experts. They're the expert uh, peer coaches and have them kind of lead the training with my support. So that's something Absolutely. we're looking in, into doing. But And it would be interesting to sort of pull out, uh, you know, I don't know how you'd assess it, but, you know, kind of pull out those kids that have that connection with so many other kids right you know yeah you or want kids that have a bit of that um social what's the word i'm looking for you know uh, the popular kids <laughs> well and i would also wonder if it, if they're in i don't even know how you'd measure this because you know you probably couldn't but um except maybe through maybe a you know a, a, some sort of a questionnaire with the with the the, the autistic kid but I'd wonder how this would sort of, if you got, you know, a larger group of peer coaches and you got the untrained peer coaches coming in doing stuff, how this would affect um, bullying and bullying levels, you know, because all of a sudden you, well, I mean, an autistic kid is easy to bully because they're alone, right? And they're, and they're by themselves and they're doing something that looks odd and, and it's really easy to kind of bully them. But if they've all of a sudden are surrounded by the cool kids, you know, and and they're being supported in that way, you know. I wonder. I wonder if that could like totally change the school experience because I think a lot of autistic kids will say that school was not their favorite time of the year. Totally. So one of the you know I call it a limitation um, of my study was I didn't include the participants with autism. I didn't. I failed. I feel like to incorporate their voices um, mm -hmm. as much as I could have. I kind of got stuck on the challenge of that because there was such significant communication delays. Um, but I think that that was, yeah, moving forward, I would I would like to push myself further with that because I think that's just so, so important. Yeah. So that we're partnering with, uh, with people with autism instead of just doing research about them. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, it, so it sounds like it's a really awesome intervention. It sounds like they're all really happy. Right. But it would be nice to have them say, I was really happy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to, to kind of validate that piece. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. 
I, I sort of, I'm looking at this sort of from the perspective of, I, I live in a small town. And so where everybody knows everybody. And it would be interesting sort of to see this kind of intervention in a small town school setting so that you could continue to see that interaction in the summer. Oh, yeah. You know, because they're all, they're all, it's a small town. Everyone still sees everybody throughout the year and they sort of have that continue on and then obviously continue on after school's done. Uh, generalization and, and maintenance uh, opportunity there for some. <laughs> yeah, 100%. Not just 100%. for clinical work, but for some research if anyone wants to yeah. go and hang out with you on your little island. Totally, yeah. Well, I'm thinking it. I'm for the for those that are are listening that maybe aren't in BC, I live on a on a kind of a rural island on the the west coast of British Columbia, but I'm a 20-minute ferry ride from a town of approximately 12,000 and it's it's a it's a town where uh it's sort of in terms of kind of autism developmental disabilities where it's it's one of the oldest agencies in the province supporting adults with developmental disabilities it was one of the first places agencies that opened when all the institutions closed and so a lot of a lot of folks kind of ended up here and it's become sort of a a hub in that way and and, and there's some neat supports and and uh kind of in that regard but everybody knows everybody uh and you'll always see you know uh, the typical kids you know saying hi to the to the neurodiverse kids, but that's as far as it goes. And so something like this would be, I think be really valuable up here. Yeah. And something I'm curious about too, if anyone's listening and trying to come up with a project, um, yeah. is, uh, I'm, I'm curious if we, if we see the same effects or we lose any effects or we see any benefits to training more kids at a time, like, can we train yeah. the whole class or do we lose? One of my concerns would be that we overwhelm the student with autism or that, you know, there's the, I don't know if bystander effect applies here, but this idea yeah. that, that everyone else thinks someone else is going to use the strategies and so no one uses them. Mm, interesting. Yeah. But these are all just, you know, musings in my brain. Sure, sure. <laughs> yeah. Well, once you have your PhD, then you can just keep going and doing more and more and more of this. Well, I think that's the plan, you know. I, got the, research, oh, I got the research bug in a big way. I didn't expect yeah. it. <laughs> No, no. But here but we are. A, I don't see a lot of it. Uh, but maybe I just I'm not paying attention. But um, it's nice to see folks that do master's research and then continue that research. Often we see kind of folks just do whatever for their master's degree to get it done and then do something different for their PhD to get it done. But it's nice to see that you're kind of building and building and building. I really think, you know, luck had to do with it. And then amazing supervision from Dr. Pat Miranda had to do yeah. with it. But I was really able to, I think the lucky part was that I just became really interested in a topic at the right time. Um, and that four years later, <laughs> I still get giddy talking about it and could talk That's to you awesome. for hours about it, which is really important awesome. when you are, uh, it's many, it's many, many, many hours thinking and for talking sure. about one single topic. So if you're a student, make sure Make, don't don't just pick a random topic just to get it yeah, done. Exactly. It's it's a, a really big opportunity to um I, I encourage I was speaking to a class recently. Um Dr. Joe Lasician kindly um invited me on a panel in in one of his research methods classes. I was saying to everyone there that if you have the opportunity to engage in research, even if you're not planning on being a researcher. Uh -huh do it. I think it just gives you such a different perspective as a clinician. It gives you a yep. different insight when you're accessing literature and you're, and you're trying to, you know, understand um, a study that you're reading and how it can be applied. I, it's just totally. invaluable. So if, uh, if you're a future BCBA who thinks I'm going to be a BCBA, not a researcher, why would I need to do that? I urge you to reconsider. And, um, you know, if you're at UBC, I'll be looking for research assistants at some point. <laughs> nice. Nice. Love that. No, that's great advice. That's great advice. And, and I'll also just give a big shout out to Pat Miranda. I mean, she, uh, I, I, I won't tell the story today, but it, I, certainly if it weren't for her, I'd be in a, a completely different place right now and probably wouldn't even have a master's degree. So many um, of us. You're not yeah. alone. Um, you know, but she, she's she's the sole reason why how that I got into the university in the first place, um, and so you know I, I I owe her a debt forever. But I'm uh, grateful to you, Dr. Miranda, for uh, uh, for supporting Thea in this because this is a super awesome 
awesome area. And I think you've, you've, you've retired, you've retired, but you've started a, a wonderful legacy here. I think so your legacy really continues cool. on in your name forever. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, so cool. Well, definitely looking forward to maybe following up with you uh, when, when, uh, when, when uh, the PhD gets finished up and having another conversation, I think that'd be pretty awesome. And uh, also would, would, would love to at some point maybe connect with the, uh, you and Dr. Knight about uh, this whole coding thing and maybe maybe something that you guys will be doing together. Who knows? I think that I think there's going to be a lot of really neat things. So I, yeah, I think it's probably a good place to wrap it up. Um, you know, once again, just thanks so much for kind of being on here and for doing this kind of work. And, you know, I, I hope uh, this leads to uh, folks getting a hold of you and want to learn more about how to do this and what this is all about, because I think it's just an amazing, sim- simple intervention. And uh Thank you. I'll give you my um, contact information, but if anyone wants to search me, I'm uh, Thea Brain at Early Autism Project, Inc. Not to be confused with Early Autism Project in the States. Ah, different things. Okay, gotcha. Yes, for sure. And I'm going to have all that information in the show notes, uh, as well as links to your paper, links to those lit reviews. I think I'll probably throw in Dr. Boudreaux's stuff, too. Um, even even Dr. Knight's stuff, I think. Why not? I think people will be interested to learn about coding and robotics, too. And uh, yeah, super awesome. Thanks again, Thea, for being on here. This was so fun. Yeah. I had a great time. Wicked.